hear me. Somebody put this down on Facebook, write it down. Those of you that's here in the church, a distraction is anything that prevents you from giving your full attention to someone or something. And in this case, Jesus and your divine purpose. That's what a distraction is, anything that'll pull you away from it. We all deal with distractions. We deal with distractions on a daily basis. But there are those who know how to deal with distractions, okay? Those that know how to deal with distractions and they could stay focused. And then there's those that they haven't learned how to deal with distractions and they become offset, off balance, okay? You know, and like I said, things coming at you from different ways and you're trying to get something done. How do you do it? That's why I wanted to talk to you about distraction. That's why I left off last week. It is not so much what we encounter, but what we do with what we encounter. I'll say that again. Not so much what Somebody put this down on Facebook, write it down. Those of you that's here in the church, a distraction is anything that prevents you from giving your full attention to someone or something. And in this case, Jesus and your divine purpose. That's what a distraction is, anything that'll pull you away from it. We all deal with distractions. We deal with distractions on a daily basis. But there are those who know how to deal with distractions, okay? Those that know how to deal with distractions and they could stay focused. And then there's those that they haven't learned how to deal with distraction and they become offset, off balance, okay? You know, and like I said, things coming at you from different ways and you're trying to get something done, how do you deal with it? And that's why I want to talk to you about distractions. That's where I left off last week. It is not so much what we encounter, but what we do with what we encounter. I'm going to say that again. Not so much what we encounter, but what we do with what we encounter. Amen. And if you make sure if you're having a problem with the sound or something of that nature, make sure you put it in there so we can know or let us know. OK. The only reason a person does not reach their potential or develop into the greatness God has placed in them is summed up, is summed up in one word. Distractions. When we say and quote that scripture. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. What we are literally saying is that God has put greatness in us. Greatness in us. And the only way we do not come to the point of walking in the greatness that God has placed in us is if we allow distractions to keep us from moving forward. That's the only way. Because God's purpose for you is for you to be great in what he's called you to do. Whether it's a mother or whether it's a CEO. He has specific things for you to do. And someone will say, well, what, how, 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 how important is it just being a mother? Well, you know what? If you deal with PTA, you're dealing with people. Uh-huh. You don't have to go in and preach to them. But they can see the joy in your life, which will open other doors. You could be at the gym having a hard session, but laughing about it. And people want to know, how are you able to get through this? It's because the greatness of God that he has placed in you. Sometimes we don't think about what God has really done. 
He has placed himself in each of us. See, in the Old Testament, we, we, we know about the, 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 the tabernacle where they met God. We know about the temple that David built for God. These were places where God resided. But today, God resides in you. I really want you to think about this. The creator of all things, the most powerful God, lives in you. He's right there in you. And you would say, my God, he, he's in me? Yes, he's in you. That's how much God loves you. But we have to recognize distractions that come in our life. We have to recognize how things and people and events will hinder you from doing what you have been called to do. As I said, we all deal with distractions. Again, I want to repeat, it's not so much what we encounter, it's how we deal with what we encounter. So how are you dealing with the distractions in your life? Keeping your focus on what is important to God will bring you to the place of greatness. Notice what I said, keeping your focus on God. Last week, I really, you know, centered in on keeping your focus. I talked about when you started to first learn to drive, you know, that 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock thing, you know. It was like this, you know, come on now, let's be real. You ain't always been leaning. You know, it was like, you know, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, you know, people talking in the back and you telling them, hey, be quiet, be quiet, keep it down, cut the radio down. You was focused. But as time went on, you started to lean a little bit. Mm -hmm cut the music up. Yeah, you know what else? Hey, you talking to people. You became comfortable. Sometimes in our walk with God, we can become so comfortable that we don't recognize the distractions that's slowing us down from going to where God wants us to go. We all have desires in what we want in life. Okay, we all, we all do. But the things that you must realize is that you must do what God wants you to do, and your desires will come along with that. You can't put your desires before what God has created you to do. He's created you for a reason. And some people say, well, I don't know what he's created me for. It's probably because you have not spent time with him seeking that out. Uh-huh. See, we have kids that go to college, and they... They go into this major, that major, this major. They got all kind of majors. And then they get their they masters and they, they get their, 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 their doctrines and they get all of this. And then they go into something totally different. All that money, all them years in college, and then you don't even do what you graduated to do. Well, it might have been a lot simpler to ask God in the beginning and you could have saved yourself a lot of money a lot of time. Do you see what I'm saying? You know, you may have a desire to be that top CEO, but that's not God's desire for you. His desire may, for you, may be for you to be the best mom you can be. Because you don't know, you might be raising up the next prophet, the next pastor, the next choir leader. See, all Mary knew was that she was going to have a child through a virgin birth. Mm -hmm. And that he was going to save the world. Emmanuel, God with us. That's all she knew. She didn't know the end runs of how. Do you see what I'm saying? You don't know how God wants to use who's in your life right now. You may be saying, oh, my child ain't doing it like that. My, that it ain't over. It ain't over. It ain't over. What are you speaking over your child? What is it that you truly want for your child? Are you talking about how bad your child is, how slow your child is? Are you, are you decreeing that my child is going to be used by God? Hmm. Somebody look at you and say, hey, not, not that individual. <laughs> you say, my child is going to be used by God. Do you see what I'm saying? See, you cannot let people's words distract you from what God has called you to do. You got to understand that. 
and, and don't get me wrong, people do not, a lot of them, some of them do know, but a lot of them don't recognize or realize that they're becoming a distraction. You have to realize that. You have to realize that. I had, um, a couple of years back, my daughter, one of my daughters was going through something. Every time it got serious, she would call me at 9 on Sunday morning, right before I'm getting ready to leave out for church. And, and I would be like, wow, man. So I started to look at it. And it was like every Sunday. This was like four or five Sundays in a row just happened. And I seen the pattern. That was a distraction. So when I stopped taking those phone calls on Sunday, the issue stopped. Do you see what I'm saying? See, I had to let my daughter know I'm not God. And you calling me like I'm God. So I must have taught you wrong. All right? I need you to trust God because I'm getting ready for service. I have a duty to God that he's called me to do. And you may say, oh, that's kind of foul, that's kind of cold. I'm not God. Did you not hear me when I said it the first time? <laughs> See, I have to trust my children with God. See, no matter what I want to do or how I want to do it, my children must be in the hands of God. And I must talk to God about my children. And I must teach them that. But I have enough sense to recognize when, whether it be my children, whether it be my wife, whether it be my dog, is trying to distract me from doing the things that God has called me to do. Because, see, at the end of the day, when I stand before God, he's not going to ask me about my distractions. He's going to ask me, why didn't you do what I created you to do? Let that sink in. That's what he's going to ask. And I truly want to hear, well done, thou good faithful servant. See, that's what I want to hear. So I purpose in my heart to recognize distractions when they come. Have you noticed when you're driving and you're, you, you, you know, you're driving and you can hear a big bang, but you still keep your eyes focused while you look around real quick, see where it's coming from. Why? Because you don't let outside events distract you to get your attention that you could cause yourself an accident. See, keeping your focus on what is important to God will bring you to the place of greatness and the place of true fulfillment. See, you could become that CEO, but if you haven't done what God has called you to do, you're always going to have an emptiness in you. You're going to feel like something's missing. See, a lot of people feel like that now because they don't have God in their life, and they're constantly chasing this thing and that thing. But see, you'll never be able to feel that, that place that God has created for himself with anything else. You'll never be able to do that. So if you don't have God in your life, you're always going to have that void. You're always going to have that emptiness. And that's what happens to people that are trying to fit other things in God's place. I don't care. It could be a relationship. It could be money, it could be a career, it could be business. You can get all of those things, but if you haven't got your relationship right with God, you're still going to be empty. You're still going to be empty. Distractions are an enemy to your success and purpose. Distractions are an enemy to your success and your purpose. Distractions are an opposition to your success and purpose. See, the Bible teaches us that the devil is a subtle, subtle, that means crafty, crude, wise. So he knows that if he can keep enough distractions in your life, you're getting older, time is going by, and hopefully you won't be able to succeed in what God has called you to do. See, so he uses these little distractions, you know, to keep you off balance. 
you must understand that people in the Bible also had distractions. One of the best examples I, 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 I see is Nehemiah. The man that cried over a broken wall. <laughs> people cry about a lot of things. People cry at weddings. People cry at, at, at funerals. People cry when children are born. But Nehemiah cried over a broken wall. And see, a little history and background on Nehemiah is this. Nehemiah was not a prophet. Nehemiah was not a priest. Nehemiah was not a king. You know what? Fab, Nehemiah was just a person with a job. Just a person with a job. He worked, you know, he worked in a high, you know, a highfalutin house, you know. That's all he was. And what happened? Someone came from Jerusalem and, you know, said, you know, and hey, Nehemiah said, hey, how you doing? He said, you know, the greetings going on. He said, well, how the people over there? He said, oh, things are bad. Nehemiah said, what? He said, things are bad. People are, you know, they're doing bad, man. Things are bad over there. And Nehemiah heard this, and it touched his heart. It touched his heart because he probably said, I'm, I'm working in this fabulous palace, and the people that I know, the people that I am attached to, they're suffering. So what does Nehemiah do? Nehemiah goes to the king and asks the king, you know, for some time off. I'm just paraphrasing. You can read this book of Nehemiah. He says, I need some time off because this is what's happening back in my homeland. But he, he, he goes to the king. So he must have been doing a good job. And the reason I say this is because basically the king said, do you need anything else? He said, man, we're going to need some wood. We're going to need some, you know. That'd be like, you know, that'd be like you go to your job and you tell them, you know, my family in Mississippi just went through a tornado and I got to go back and visit my family and help them. And then your boss said, you need any money? And you say, yeah, 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 yeah. And he gives you what you need. But then he asked Nehemiah this question. He said, how long will you be gone? Nehemiah gives him a date and a time that he will return. So you have to have in your projects, you need to know when you want to complete them. Or you'll be doing the same project for 25 years. You on, you on point because you ain't got no time frame. Okay? So he, he gives a time frame. But understand that Nehemiah is not a prophet. He's not a king. He's not a priest. He's a man with a job. What does God give him? A burden, a passion for his people. A lot of times you say you don't know what God has called you to do. What is your passion for? Is it for reaching people? Is it for seeing people's lives change? Well, then, you know what your passion is. That's where God has placed a burden on you for that particular thing. So now, Nehemiah goes. He goes there. And, and, and I like this part. Well, he doesn't tell anybody what he's, going, what he's really there for. You know, he just, you know, he observes. See, sometimes you have to observe things that are around you. He just observes. So one night he decides to go out and look at this broken down wall. Now understand, some people will say, a broken down wall? You know, it's not like the brick wall in your backyard, okay? No. It's a long wall, and you have to understand that walls in that day and age in that period, it represented something. A strong wall represented a strong people. A wall also kept out the elements that you didn't want in. See, a wall played an important part, but the children of Israel's wall had been torn down. It was in rubbles. So anything could come in and out. To, to other people coming up, they look weak and feeble. So Nehemiah goes out at night to investigate the wall. Now, he leaves with people, but he tells them, you stay here. Because he wants to observe what needs to be done without the influence of other people in his ear. Sometimes you need to get to yourself and think about what's really important. How are you going to do this? How, how Lord, do you want me to do this? Not about how you want to do it. How does God want you to do it? Because that's where you're going to get the best direction is how he wants you to do it. So 
So we're talking about distraction. In Nehemiah 6, chapter 2, that's Nehemiah 6, verse 2 through 4, it reads this way. It was three people, and they tell, they tell, they tell Nehemiah, they say, come on down off the wall. Let's meet. Let's, let's, let's chop it up. And let's talk about some things. Look at Nehemiah's response. I'm doing important work, and I can't come down. Why should I, why should the work cease why I leave it and go down to you? In other words, I can't stop what I'm doing right now, so why should I stop to hang out with you? This is important. I can hang out with you next week. I need to get this done now. See, Nehemiah had his priorities right. See, you, you on a mission for God and your phone rings and you, you, you well, oh, hold on, hold on, Lord, I'm going to back, I'm gonna get back to you. Because, you know, Betty Jane wants me to run over here to the grocery store with her. And, you know, she always doing things for me. That's okay. You can do that after you finish God's work. Amen. See, your priorities. Nehemiah told him, he said, no, man, I'm not coming down off this wall. This work is too important. See, the things that God has called you to do is too important, not only for you, but for the people that God will use you to reach. It's too important. See, my, Nehemiah is exceptionally a good example of someone that had to face distractions even, even in the midst of adversity. You have, you have God-given purpose. You have a God-given purpose. Stop looking at what somebody else is doing and thinking that their work is more important than the work you, you have been called to do. You want a better example? John the Baptist. Check it out. Dude comes out of the wilderness. All right? John the Baptist comes out of the wilderness eating locusts and honey <laughs> and camel's hair. All right? He was not concerning himself about the priests and how well they were dressed. He concerned himself with his mission for God. He says, I am just one crying in the wilderness. He says, it's not about my appearance. It's not about how well I speak. It's not about my education. It's about my assignment that God has given me. What assignment has God given you? You may look strange to people because I'm quite sure him coming out of the wilderness looking like that. People said, man, who is that? But the thing that was so attractive to the people was the word that was coming out of his mouth. Repent and be baptized. He came with a word from God. So, so, so people didn't care how he was dressed. Because if you go back, they hadn't had a word from a prophet in over 300 years. From Malachi to Matthew. Hadn't had a word from God. Not a word from God. Nothing. God ain't said nothing to nobody in 300 years. Wasn't no prophet going 300 years. So when this man comes out of the wilderness talking about thus says the Lord, he got everybody's attention. How many people do you know? that has lived in a dry place that's waiting for you to open up your mouth with a word from God. So even though he was faced with hard tasks, he remained focused. He didn't let distractions pull him away. Even though there was opposition and distraction, he remained focused. People, think about how much you have been distracted from what you have been called to do, what God has placed in your heart to do. I know somebody going to say, well, you know what? I got this to do. I got that to do. I was just talking to my wife about my grandson. We have the pleasure of raising him while our daughter works, but his schedule is like crazy. <laughs> His schedule is like crazy. He don't want to go to bed till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, 
he's smart enough now that when we put him in his bed, he clams out of his bed. He running through the second floor. You know, so we talked about it yesterday, and I said, look, we have to get him on a schedule. His schedule has to be that we have to wake him up at this time of morning, all right? He'll take a nap in the day, and we've learned that if he takes a late nap, he's going to be up into the wee hours. So maybe you need to take and put your children on a schedule that they recognize, see, that they have a schedule. Or maybe you have to do like I do. I know if he's going to get up at 8, 30, 9 o'clock, I got to be up at 6. Why? So I can knock out what I need to knock out before he gets on his mission. Do you see? Sometimes the reason we don't get things accomplished is because we're too lazy to readjust our schedule. I can't lose that 15 minutes sleep. You ain't been doing it. Uh, come on now, let's tell the truth. You know, that 15 minutes sleep when you ain't getting but four hours is precious. But uh, would you rather lose 15 minutes sleep than to lose 15 days in completion of the project that you need? There's a choice. So Nehemiah remained remarkably focused on the task that God had called him to do in spite of all his distractions. In fact, the more pressure that was applied to him, the harder he stayed focused. See, what did, Nehemiah, what did Nehemiah know that we needed to know? I seen two things. Even though Nehemiah was chosen to build the wall, he knew that the wall was a God project. See, he knew that the wall was a God project. See, you may think because you decided to get the gym membership that that was you. You know, I mean, really, you really, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on, I'm on, you know, just coming up New Year's, I'm on change. And you get this, but God's plan is for somebody to see your life, that your life will change their behavior. Do you see what I'm saying? See, a lot of times we want to give our credit, like, ourselves so much credit like we so smart. You know you ain't that smart. <laughs> no, come on, man. I mean, really. But. It doesn't have to be a big thing. Your life could change the person's life that's going to change policy in the world. You know, and God uses you without you even knowing, but the thing of it is, you were obedient to stay focused to the task. Do you see what I'm saying? So even though Nehemiah was chosen to build a wall, he knew that it was a God project. See, that's where we have to make sure that we always keep God first place. See, we can't keep going and just quote the scripture, seek ye first. You know how you know how people get spiritual? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. But everything you want to do is before God. You know, I got chest ties early this morning. <laughs> I was listening to a pastor. And so... For a few weeks, God would wake me up 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, all right? I'm like, man, you know, I don't feel like getting up out of this bed. It's cold. You understand me? I don't want to walk to my office. I mean, come on. I'm like, you mean the pastor feels like that? Yeah. Pastor cold just like you are in the morning. And so this morning, I flip on this, this pastor, and I'm listening to him, and the first thing he's talking about, Stay focused. And I'm like, uh-huh, okay, all right. He said there's three watches, three prayer watches, 9 to 12, 12 to 3, 3 to 6. I forgot the exact time. He says, so if God is waking you up at that time of morning, he's waking you up to pray on that watch. I said, oh, Lord. I said, man, that was for me. That was for me. Because there's no other reason for me to continue to wake up at that time in the morning. Do you hear what I'm saying? See, you think that when God wakes you up, it's to go to the bathroom. Okay, maybe so. But maybe it's for you to pray when you finish in the bathroom. Do you see what I'm saying? So 
that hit me because I've been ducking. I've been ducking that three, you know, that three, three a.m. call, and I look at my clock. It would be between three and three sixteen. I'm waking up like this, and I'm like, man, okay. So you know, I take the lazy way out. I lay there and stay in the bed and just pray. And then, next thing I know, it's seven o'clock in the morning. I'm waking up. Oh, okay. You know, that's the lazy way out. Somebody, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody needed prayer. And God honored me with the, with the ability to be able to pray for whoever it was. I may not know who it was, but God knows. So your purpose is important. Your purpose is important. The second thing that we learn from Nehemiah is that Nehemiah could not do it without God. Stop trying to do your stuff without God. You know, stop trying to live your life without God. Well, no, 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 I don't live my life without God. Just because you say you don't doesn't mean you don't. My question to you is how often are you asking God, is this what he wants you to do, instead of you just doing something and then asking God to bless what you have done? Hello? Uh-uh. We have to come to God and say, okay, Lord, is this really what you want me to do? And then, you know, when you hear him nudge you that that's not what he wants you to do, don't act like you don't hear. Is that you, Lord? Is that you, Lord? Is that you? You know it's him. So we have to do what the scripture says, seek ye first. What comes before first? Nothing. It says seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All right. So if we're seeking that, if we're seeking that, we know that God is well enough, good enough to give us everything else that we need. I mean, I, I keep telling you, all you've heard me say it many times. I was a bad kid growing up. Bad, bad, bad. I, I, look, I was a baby kid before baby's kid. OK, and put it like that. And if you all don't know what baby kids is, just leave it alone. But when I was good. I'd get rewarded with all kind of little trips and stuff. You understand me? You know, I really would. So, so I, I, I knew being good got me rewards. If you're doing what God has called you to do, if you're seeking him first, if you're talking to him on a regular basis, how can you even imagine that God will not bless you and give you favor? If my parents, which were worldly, did it for me, I know that God will do it for you. See, this is where we have to flip the script this come year. We have to not take into 2021 what we want to leave in 2020. See, you got to leave it. See, you don't, see, you got to leave it, bury it, walk away from it, and say, you know what? I'm coming anew in 2021. I'm coming anew. And you walk with your head up because you know what? You're not walking by yourself. Because he said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Say, I'm walking into my destiny. I'm walking into the newness of my life. I'm walking into my future. I'm walking into my dreams. I'm walking into everything that God has promised me. So you got to know that God is a God that will never renege, renege on his promises. His promises are yes and amen as it says in scripture. The challenge is this. Will you believe him? Will you believe him? God has the family that you desire. He has the home that you desire. Man, look, look, look. They used to, there was a movie out years back. Uh, uh, I forgot the actors, but it was entitled, I Got the Hookup. You know, about these guys with these cell phones, and they was hooking everybody up. Cell phones. Well, I'm telling you, God got the hookup that you need. He got the hookup that you need. But will you put him first? Will you trust him? See, it's hard for some people to trust God with their lives because they have been so bad with their own lives, they're scared to trust anybody else, especially God with their life. I'm challenging you, trust God as we come out of this. Trust God coming into 2021. 
See, Nehemiah had been called to do something. Just a regular man. I mean, really. Just, he wasn't, I mean, he wasn't a prophet. He wasn't, he wasn't a priest. He wasn't a king. He was a man with a job that had been called by God for an assignment. What have you been called for? Have you been called to raise a family? Hmm? Have you been called to start a business? Have you been called to start a ministry? Have you been called to live a life? What is the call on your life? It's no different than what the call was on Nehemiah. If you just don't get distracted, if you just don't let life and things pull you away, see, you've got to stay focused. You've got to stay focused. See, God has a project for each and every one of us. See, my project is to do exactly what I'm doing right now. That's why I'm here 52 Sunday, 50, 52 Sundays out of the week. But last year I missed a few. It wasn't due to my own, but by the grace of God, I'm back. You know, um, that's my call. It's not about whether I want to do it or I enjoy doing it. It's, it's the fact that's my call. My enjoyment comes from knowing that I'm doing what God has set me to do. It's to bring you a word, to bring you a message, to see your lives change. See, to be a part of what God is doing in your life, to encourage you, to point you in the right direction, to tell you, you understand, when you're messing up, you know, I, I've told you, and I'm talking to some of you out there listening now. I'm not going to bite my tongue when you're out of line. I'm going to straight put you in check. Why? Because I love you. I'd rather you walk away and be upset with me than me to lie to you and you live your life unsuccessful. So if you want somebody to lie to you, find somebody else. I'm not your pastor. If you want somebody that's going to be truthful to you, I'll be truthful to you. But love me for being truthful and telling you, you understand me, you know, pull it together. Stop faking and shaking, man. Stop impersonating a Christian. Start being one. And I'm telling you this in love. Don't be a word, don't be a Christian just in word. But let your deeds magnify what your life is speaking to others. See, Jesus said in, in, in John 15, 5, he says, you can't do nothing without me. Straight up. I like Jesus. He said, you can't do nothing without me. Stop trying to do what you're doing without him. I know you may have started some things right now that you didn't involve him. All you have to do at this point is say, Lord, forgive me for not inviting you into my decisions, but would you help me to work out what I've already started? But from here in, I'm going to consult with you before I get involved in anything else. That's coming real. That's being straight up. Huh? You can't be no better. You can't be no more straight up than that. You really can't. It's like, Lord, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I, I, I made this decision without you. But would you help me? Show me how to include you as I'm doing now all the way through what I'm doing. But from here forward, Lord, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to ask you, you know. And Lord, help me. If, if, I, if I start in things that you don't want me to do, slam the door shut in my face, Lord. Don't let me go through the door. Slam it until I'm, a new, um, until I'm mature enough to understand what you want from me. In Mark 10, 27, Jesus says, For with God all things are possible. What are you trying to do? With him all things are possible. So, so ooh-wee. Lord, thank you, Jesus. There's nothing beyond what you can't do because all things are possible with him. What is it that you really want to do in your life? What is it that you really want to do? Because it says all things are possible with him. You know, really, all things. What is it you want to do? Some people may want to have a big house. Some other person may just want to have a happy life. He said, but you can do whatever you want. See, he gives that to you. Whatever your scale of life you want, he'll give that to you. He says you can do all things with him, but you can't do nothing without him. 
So start being prayerful about your future. We should already be praying about 2021. No, we don't have to wait. You won't wait till the ball drop in New York. You understand? Ain't nobody gonna be out there. Yeah, I take that lie back. Gonna be some <laughs> fools out there. You understand me? I hope they wear masks. You know, and somebody will say, oh, there he go with that mask thing. You right, where my mask at? I keep one. You understand me? Because I don't want somebody breathing on me that got that foolishness. Yes, I do believe in God, but I believe that God has created these to help me protect myself from the enemy and from a virus. People, I love you, and I want you to stay safe. Say what you want about me. I might put you on today now that you said that. Uh, all right, keep your focus and don't be distracted. Nehemiah had to constantly face the attacks of three different men. You can read that in the book of Nehemiah. They were continually trying to get him off focus. You know, I mean, come on, you know. Come on, Nehemiah, come on down, man. Let's go have lunch, man. I got your favorite thing over here. Come on down. But see, Nehemiah wouldn't fall for the okie doke. Nehemiah was even able to train the people to work with one hand and keep a weapon in the other. Read it. Why? Because we got work to do, but just in case we attack, we ready too. So you do, you do your work and you stay prayerful. You stay prayerful. That's your sword. You stay prayerful as you do what you do. It may take you some time to grow to be disciplined enough that you don't allow distractions to distract you. But if you're working on it, God will help you because it says you can do all things with him. All things. My goal is to teach you what this Bible says about you. To teach you what God says about you. To teach you what God says he will do for you. That's what this word is. That's what this Bible is. It is a living word of God that many people's lives are here to, to direct us and show us that God is not a respecter of person. See, if God used the Esther, he'll use you. Mm -hmm. If God used an Elisha, he'll use you. If God used a John the Baptist, he'll use you. And your ministry may be different than others, but that don't mean it's not less anointed. It's not less anointed. <clears throat> Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, as I close. You will keep, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. God bless you. This is Pastor Mel, the Great I Am Faith Center. I pray that this message has been a blessing to you and that you will also join us next week to see what God has for us. God bless you. Love you with all my heart. In Jesus' name.